Do you have a sales funnel that works? A few months ago, my husband and I dropped $6,000 to buy Jed a set of braces from the orthodontist. And you guys, their sales funnel was amazing. As I was going through it, I kept thinking, I have to share this with my digital farmers. Sometimes I think the best way to learn how to do a sales funnel is to see one in action in another industry. So that's what I'm gonna do today, and we're gonna see how we can optimize your sales funnel. Hey there, this is Corinna Bench, and welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast. In today's market, it's not enough to just grow your product. You've got to know how to sell it, too. Welcome to the My Digital Farmer Podcast, where we reveal online marketing strategies and tips to help farmers like you get better and more confident at marketing. Learn how to find more customers, increase your sales, and build a strong brand for your farm. Let's start the show. Well, welcome to episode 173 of the My Digital Farmer podcast. I'm your host, Corinna Bench, one of the farmers at Shared Legacy Farms CSA out in Elmore, Ohio. I'm also the founder of MyDigitalFarmer.com, which is all about trying to help other farmers like you get more confident in your marketing and sales strategy and execution so that you can grow a profitable business that you love. How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to the show. A big shout out to my regular listeners. If you are new to the podcast, I'm especially glad that you're here today. Make sure that you subscribe to the show and go check out my first 10 episodes. They were designed to be an on-ramp into the marketing jungle. So if you aren't really sure where to begin and you feel a little overwhelmed, that is a great place to start the journey. Well, before I get started today, let me give a shout out to this episode's sponsor, Local Line. I am a huge fan. Um, if you don't know who they are, Local Line is the operating system for the family farm. In addition to hosting your online store, you can use Local Line to get organized for inventory management, deliveries, and even online payments. Local Line's comprehensive list of features is going to help you increase your sales, streamline your processes, and it's going to save you time. It's trusted by over 11,000 farmers and producers. Local Line offers farmers the ability to own their own sales channels and reach their customers in a whole new way. And Local Line is now available in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and Ireland. Try Local Line today for free and get a premium feature using my coupon code, DigitalFarmer2022. Terms and conditions apply. For more information, go check out the link in my show notes. And now back to the show. So I am sitting here all alone in the house right now recording this podcast because my boys have left to go to the demolition derby, the combine demolition derby at the Wood County Fair, which is one of their favorite things to do with grandpa that means I have the house to myself. Yes, I did pass on that opportunity. That's not exactly my idea, my idea of a super fun time. And I'm really looking forward to having some time alone. I'm an introvert. And my brother from Oregon came out to visit me this past week. And I had little nephews running around. And it was awesome. But I really am looking forward to having some time to myself to recharge. So... Here I am doing a podcast first, and then I'm going to sit down and get a glass of wine and read a book for fun. Super looking forward to that. By the way, for those of you who participated in the Instagram Reels Challenge last week, thanks for doing that. That, I, that was so fun. I had a super good time. I hope you learned a lot. If you still want to participate in that challenge, you want to learn the mechanics of reels, how they work, you can sign up for that. It's still going on. Um, just go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash reels. And it's an email challenge every day for five days. You're going to get a short video demo from me that teaches you the mechanics of reels and then a quick challenge to practice that skill while you actually make a reel. So by the time you're done, um, with those five days, you know enough about how to do reels that you're, you're good enough to, to kind of get started. So that was the goal. And uh, I thought it was a huge success. Thanks for all of you who participated. 
And just because the live challenge is over doesn't mean you can't do it later on. So just head to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash reels if you want to take that challenge. All right, well, let's get started with today's episode. I have been wanting to do this topic for several months now. We are going to do an audit of a sales funnel for my son's orthodontist. Now, wait, don't leave. Don't turn off the podcast. Hear me out. This is why I wanted to do this episode, because I find that these kind of practical um podcast episodes where I take an actual business in the real world, even if it's not a farm, and I walk through how they go about finding a customer, converting them into a sale, and then turning them into a lifelong fan. I think these are incredibly instructional. When I was first learning about marketing, I didn't know that there was a sales framework. I didn't know there were steps that salespeople move clients along in order to turn them into a paying customer. And when I learned what the framework was, I started to see it all over the place in action in some of these companies that actually knew what they were doing. So I love doing these kinds of podcast episodes where I can show you in real time like, hey, This is what it looks like for a business to take the framework and actually put it into action and get someone to buy something. Because I spent like six grand on this investment. And how does a person get to that place where they're ready to drop a whole bunch of cash with someone? I mean, that is a a long warm up process. And so I think for some of us, especially if you're like a CSA farmer or you sell a high end premium product, There is some value to learning what the framework is and seeing it in action in another industry and then trying to imagine what could that look like for my product or my service. So that's my goal for today. Um, I'm going to walk you through the sales process that was done on me and it worked fabulously well. You know, it's funny because because I'm really into marketing. I can't help but see it everywhere I go. So as it was happening to me, I was very aware of it. I was actually taking notes and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a podcast episode. Um, I think it was episode, let me look real quick, um, episode 133, where I did a very similar kind of thing. I audited the sales funnel for the Hocking Hills Canopy Tour that we did last fall. We decided to go on a zipline tour. This was also an expensive product and they had a fabulous sales process for roping us in and getting us to say yes. And um, I really recommend you go listen to that one as well and then listen to this one too. And you're gonna see very similar steps that were being taken and executed by these different industries. So uh, my goal is that you listen to this today, maybe come back later and take some notes. And I'm gonna walk you through each of the steps that happened along the way. And then I'm gonna pull out kind of an application point um, after each step and help you see, you know, what what would this look like for your type of product or service? And if you're listening to this later and kind of taking notes, I think this could be a really powerful exercise for you. If you don't have a sales funnel, um, you really should think about putting one together. And they do not have to be complicated. I have a very simple one that is continuing to execute year after year. In fact, sometimes I feel kind of guilty because I don't really feel like I'm doing a lot of marketing anymore for my CSA, like a lot of difficult marketing. I feel like I'm kind of just recycling the same stuff and pushing the flywheel because I know what my sales funnel is and it works and it's simple and effective and I have the systems in place. So when you see another industry, another business doing this well, it's worth noting and paying attention to how are they actually taking the framework and putting it into practice with their business. So Let's get started. Are you ready? How did this orthodontist convince me to buy his services? Here we go. So the very first thing that happened is that a problem manifested in our family. We went to the dentist and the dent, my son went to the dentist, Jed. So he's in eighth grade. He's going into ninth grade. At the time he was in eighth grade. And the dentist actually made me aware of the problem. He said, hey, your son is going to need braces. Now, I kind of knew that. Like, my son has had crooked teeth and the big spaces between them. And I figured that it was coming. But I didn't realize 
that it was now, like now was the time. And in fact, the dentist kind of put a little bit of the fear of God into me because he said, your time is running out. There is an ideal time for us to be shaping the mouth um, before it starts to really kind of solidify. And, and we really want to be taking care of this um, now in the eighth grade year. Probably you should have done this a little bit sooner. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? He still has some teeth in there, that baby teeth that haven't come out. I was waiting for all those to come out. He's like, yeah, we'll take care of that. We'll pull them. Like, we need to get this going now, okay? And so I went home, I told my husband, and the search began. So that's kind of the first step. And this is the application that I want to pull out of this, that your client that ends up buying your product or service also has a trigger. Something triggers their action. Something triggers them to come and look for you. Maybe it's a problem that manifests in their life. It could be a health thing. It could be a sudden feeling of, um, gosh, I'm not a, a good mom because my kids aren't eating well. Um, it could be a desire that manifests. I really love cooking. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I would love to get weird vegetables every week to just push myself and challenge myself. That sounds like a lot of fun, okay? So a desire could manifest, or there could be someone or something else that triggers it. So what I want you to think about is what are the circumstances that cause someone to enter your sales funnel? This is a really important question to dial in for your business because everybody enters your business through some kind of door. There's some reason that they decide to start researching you or looking into your product. When does that taxi light turn on and they are ready to accept passengers? You've got to know what some of those key moments are. And this becomes more and more clear the longer you are in business, the longer you sell your product. So if you are just at the beginning of your journey and you're like, Corinne, I have no idea. Well, then I would go and ask your customers. You need to actually research this information. In fact, I have a workshop, an online course that you can take. It's pretty quick. Um, it's called Customer Research Bootcamp, and it teaches you the research methods that you can use to figure out this information. Incidentally, if you want to learn more about that workshop, you can go to mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash research, and it'll tell you all about it. And that once you know what this is, it's so powerful because then you know how to start talking about your product on the front end, how to start inviting them into your sales funnel. You've got to know what are the pain points that most people feel, and that's the stuff you begin speaking about early on in your marketing, okay? So we wanna make sure that we hit these timing windows, that we know when people get triggered, where are they when they, when they get triggered, what is the thing that comes up for them in their mind, and then we talk about those things. This is all about that concept of having the right offer at the right time. Um, so that's sort of step number one, realizing that your customer also has a problem or a desire that your product or service meets for them. There's a transformation that happens and they are seeking that and you need to know what that is and you need to know those moments when it's triggered. Okay, so really spend some time thinking about that. Okay, let's move on to the next step in this story. I found myself dragging my feet Okay, this is the drag my feet phase of the sales funnel. So I came home, I told my husband, this is what the dentist said, and then I found myself wanting to put it off. There were all kinds of things going on in my mind, like the cost was the big one. I mean, I guess I knew that this was coming down the pike eventually, but when I found out from some of my friends that it was in the vicinity of like five or $6,000, like I almost had a heart attack because I have that in my savings, but like it would really kind of take a big dent out of my savings. And I'm like, Whoa, all right, I was hoping to buy a car with some of that money. But all of a sudden that was having to go to somewhere else, right? So I had this scarcity mindset of like, oh no, I, I don't know if I have enough or if I choose to invest in this, I'm going to have to sacrifice something else. And I didn't exactly know how much it would be with these different orthodontists because I hadn't really researched yet but I just had in my mind that it was gonna be a lot of money. The second thing was that I had this idea that it was gonna be a time suck, 
Okay, and that's why I kept putting it off. So the process of interviewing and going around and meeting the different orthodontists, I didn't want to make this big expensive decision without being thoughtful about it. And so I knew that I would want to go and interview a a couple of them at least. And so the, you know, oh man, I'm gonna have to call them up. I'm gonna have to set up a time. We're all gonna have to go together. I'm gonna have to find time in my schedule. And then I'm gonna have to research stuff. Like that's all extra time in my life. And I just didn't really feel like doing it, right? I didn't even know what all was involved in the research process or what was going to come up. And it just felt overwhelming. And then the third thing that it was, there was just decision paralysis going on. Um, Who do I choose? And how do I decide who the best one should be? What, What are the things that I should be thinking about? And what if I choose the wrong person? What if I don't do my due diligence and I, and I get the bad orthodontist, right? So here's kind of the application for this. Sometimes in the sales funnel, at this stage, right after the problem surfaces, there is this objection, this objection phase, like a mountain that your customer feels like they have to overcome before they're even willing to keep moving down this funnel and this process. And the greater the financial investment or the investment of time, I think the higher the risk, um, the the harder this is gonna be for someone to actually decide. So your customer is going to have objections that come up for them, little myths that they have in their mind, Um, mindset blocks. They're going to have questions like legitimate logistical questions that feel like a big deal. And this is all normal. Okay. This is a normal part of any buying process. If you think about the last big purchase you made, you probably had some questions that you wanted answered before you decided between different models, or you had some things you had to have answered or objections in your mind that you had to get over. Right? So here's what I want you to realize that as a business owner and a salesperson, like You've got to anticipate that your clients are going to have questions too before they decide to choose you over another farmer. So how are you going to overcome those questions? You need to have a process in your sales system to overcome the questions and the mindset blocks that people are having. You need to know what the questions are, first of all. So that's also part of that customer um, research process that I was talking about in the boot camp. You need to ask your customers, what were those questions that you had? What were the things that were holding you back? Here's a question that I like to kind of play around with when I'm helping um, other farmers think through this. I ask, what does my future client need to believe, know, or unlearn to be ready to start working with me? Those are three different things, right? What do they need to believe? What do they need to know? And what do they maybe need to unlearn before they're ready to say yes to working with me? Your sales process needs to address these. So an example in my business in the CSA is I have a a lead, a lead, what I call a lead magnet or a PDF guide that people can download. It's called the six questions to ask before you join a CSA. Um, I want to make sure that I filter out the people that really aren't a good fit. And some of the questions that people have get addressed in that document. Um, Another common question that I have is, what's going to be in the box? Am I going to like what you give me? And so I have this what's in the box guy that shows them photographs of last season's boxes. And they can just see this is an example of a typical year. Is this something you'd like? Um, I have a a trial membership now, which is a four-week sampler box. And they get to try out the CSA membership. Every three weeks, they get a different box. And it's like, hey, you know, this is a lower risk, lower price point. This is a way for you to overcome that objection that you might have to see if you would actually like it. Okay. And then like maybe in my Facebook posts or on social media or on Instagram, I might have content where I'm addressing some of the objections I know people have like picky eaters. Or I show pictures of what people are making with the box to help them imagine themselves like, yes, you can actually cook really cool stuff with the stuff we're going to give you. And they can mirror themselves and see themselves in living vicariously through these posts that other members are are making on my page, right? So 
Um, once you know what the objections are, what the questions are, you can be creating content in your social media, in your emails, in your sales process, um, in your lead generation strategies that are trying to answer those things. Okay, so that's what I want you to think about in this phase. I want you to kind of take some time and write down what are the questions my customers typically ask before they are ready to move forward? What are some of those myths that they have to unlearn, that I have to knock down? What are the obstacles I have to overcome for them? And then look at what are some ways that I can put a, like a system in place to make sure that that happens, okay? All right, let's move on to the third step in the story. So after I kind of worked through my objections and I was like, I gotta move on this, I've gotta start taking action. The next thing that I did is I went and I asked my friends for referrals. Well, the dentist gave me a referral. Guess who they recommended? Yeah, the orthodontist that works with their office. I didn't trust that recommendation because I knew they were getting a major affiliate cut. So I went to my friends and I asked them, who did you use? Now, I had the benefit that Jed was actually behind the eight ball and most of his friends have already gotten braces. So I knew a bunch of people already who'd had successful runs with an orthodontist. And I had two names that surfaced again and again, Dr. Downey and Dr. Alvareta, I think his name was. Now, one of my friends happened to be a dental hygienist. And so her referral counted way more in my books because of her kind of expert status and she'd seen different kids come through her office right who had been with different orthodontists and i ultimately chose the one that she recommended but the point of this kind of section is that word of mouth and testimonials were a huge part of my decision making process and they were actually pretty early on in the sales process before I started going and doing research on the websites for the different um, uh, orthodontists, I actually went and asked my friends. And they were the ones who helped me kind of curate all the different orthodontists that were out there and decide where, where am I even gonna start looking first. Now, this orthodontist practice actually has a system in place where they ask their current clients to refer them to their friends and they reward them when they do. There's actually a, a credit that goes onto your account or they give you a gift card if you've already paid in full. So I remember when I asked my friend Kelly, she said, hey, if you decide to go with Dr. Alvareta, make sure you mention my name because that'll give me a, you know, a discount off of my balance that I still owe. Okay, so my question here, the application question here for your sales funnel, for your product, is how are you activating and using word of mouth because it's huge. It's huge. In fact, I would argue for a CSA, it's still our number one way that we find new customers. I think I do a pretty awesome job on social media. Uh, I have a really great email um, sales funnel, but most of the people find out about it because their friends rave about it. My, their friends, my customers know other people who are foodies who are like-minded who value this the things that our business stands for and they're the ones who talk about it and then the people find out about us so um, i think it helps focusing your business on a specific niche here you want to make it easy for your customers to know what to say about you if you're like good at a lot of different things um, it has, people might have a hard time kind of pinpointing what you want them to say about you but if you are known for your sweet corn like you'll have them say things like oh my gosh it is the best sweet corn in northwest ohio or in the toledo area or it is the best csa like if you have people saying little phrases like that or maybe um maybe you have a huge line at the farmer's market for your bacon and you know it's a 15 minute line and everybody knows it and it causes everyone to look and say, whoa, that must, what, what's that line all about? And people are like, oh my gosh, that's the bacon line. Okay. Now everyone thinks that you have the best bacon in town, right? So sometimes it's just a physical thing, like a giant line forming at your booth. How, um, how can you focus on a niche and help talk that one thing up a ton and train your customers? This is what I want you to say about me. Okay. Word of mouth is really huge and you need to be looking for ways to activate it. Um, Google reviews are also 
an important element here. I don't remember if I talk about that later in this episode, but um, making sure that you have testimonials in your sales pipeline somewhere. You should have a testimonials page on your website where you just have like maybe five customer reviews. Um, having like a, a banner section on the homepage of your website, maybe like the third or fourth element down, you've got a couple of faces of customers and a quick review, posting testimonials on your social media as a ritual post on a regular basis or posting something that people have made with your food. That's essentially a testimonial. Um, that should be a part of your sales rotation because it shows people, hey, other people like my product, you will too. Okay, so be thinking about that for this step. That's kind of your application. Like, what are you doing? What are some things that you can add into your system, your marketing system, that are going to get this word of mouth testimonial piece working? Because for a lot of people, when it's a high ticket item, that's one of the first things they do is they go and ask their friend, what do you use? Which CSA are you a part of, right? Where do you get your beef? Okay, let's move on. The next step, after I had been given these names, I Googled my finalists. And here's what I Googled. I typed in orthodontists near me. And I was kind of curious to see if the names that I had been given showed up. And I also typed in the specific name of the practice into Google. Downey Orthodontics, for example, okay? so that I could more quickly find the URL listing for that practice and just go right to their website. And those are two different search intents. That's kind of what I want to point out here. Like sometimes you have a person who knows the name of your farm already and they are actively searching for your farm. They maybe don't know what your URL address is, so they just go type it right into Google. But sometimes it's, oh, they don't know who the farms are. And so they just type in the category that you are and say, farmer's market's near me, okay? so. You want to be showing up in those top three answers. You want to be showing up in the top top spot, in fact. Um, SEO, search engine optimization, really matters. And if you haven't listened to episode 169, go back and listen to that. I interviewed Jesse Dolan, who is the um, podcast host of Local SEO Tactics, which is my favorite SEO podcast. And he talks all about how to go about getting your... Um, website to rank higher in Google. Google reviews is one of those ways. Um, but when I went and searched and Googled my finalists, what I was looking for <clears throat> is number one, I wanted to find out their phone number. Okay, so I was looking for some information and I wanted to see where they were on the map. Were they close to us? Was this gonna be convenient, easy to drive? And I noticed there are Google reviews. Now, if you've ever done any kind of a search on Google and the map pack is pop, kind of pops up and you see a, a map of the area and they, Google will lift up like the top three places within that map, then you know what I'm talking about. It'll list the name of the business and then it'll have the number of stars and you'll see something like 47 reviews or 194 reviews or whatever. Well, one of those orthodontists, Downey Orthodontics, had way more reviews than the other guy did. And so that just kind of solidified that, yes, I'm on the right track and this might be the one that I should choose. Okay, it was that social proof that I was looking for. So this application from this step is I want you to realize how important it is to pay attention to your SEO, that people are going to go to Google, especially if they don't really know the name of your business they're going to go to Google and they're going to try to find out information about you. What is Google going to tell them? Have you optimized your Google business profile so that it says the right thing so that Google knows what to say to this person and shows them the right stuff so that it's the correct, accurate information. You don't want somebody reading something on Google that Google tried to put together based on its best guess of what you have out there in the digital world. And then it ends up being wrong. And then this person comes and they're like, no, this isn't what I was looking for. Right? So, what do you have, what shows up about you on Google? Make sure you're grooming that Google business profile. And I'll make sure that I link this up in the show notes. I have a couple of episodes where I talk about how to optimize um, that Google business profile. I also have a workshop that you can take if you wanna learn how to put together your Google business profile and optimize it. And you can grab that at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash SEO workshop. It's going to help you optimize your Google business profile so that you can get found on Google. 
All right, let's move on. The next step, after I had Googled my finalists, I had kind of landed on these two names. Um, the next step was the free consultation, the tryout phase, okay? This is where both orthodontists had a chance to give me a sales pitch. Now, I didn't actually go and visit the first orthodontist, Dr. Alvaredo. Um, I forget why. There was a reason why I couldn't go. So Kurt took Jed. Um, but I did take Jed to the second one, and Kurt didn't go to that one. So uh, I was the primary uh, parent that was in attendance there. Now, I can only speak to the experience of the second orthodontist, and I have to say that they did a fantastic job in this stage. There were some very specific things that happened while I was at the office during the sales pitch that I think were fabulous and have some applications for us too. So first of all, when we walked into the waiting room, I walked up to the desk and there was a sign on the countertop that said, welcome new patients. And then there were two names listed and one of them was my son's name, Jed Bench. Now at first I was a little bit like, what? Wait, I haven't officially become a new patient yet. This is just, you know, a sales pitch, right? Like I'm just meeting them. And then I reassured myself like, yeah, yeah, I think they know that. I, they're probably just trying to make me feel really welcome. But that was an important step. And I'm sure they did it on purpose because they want me to already imagine myself and label myself as one of their patients. Okay, so that was a very welcoming step. And it just showed me that they're thinking about their new people. I felt welcomed. I felt really, really welcomed. Like they were thoughtful and excited that I was there. Now, I actually met with their sales team first. They had a sales rep. The orthodontist did not come until later on. And it was her job to walk me through the whole process. You know, here's how it would work if you decided to go with us. Here's the timeline. Um, the doctor is going to come in here. He's going to take a look at your mouth. He's going to give you a suggested amount of time he thinks it's going to happen. Um, we're going to have a diagnosis. We're going to take some pictures of Jed's mouth. And then she had this big folder. It was a very nice piece of marketing with gorgeous brochures in them that had pictures of... Uh, some of the different apparatuses that might end up going onto his teeth, the different colors of braces. And then she sort of had her, what I would call her offer. So it was a piece of paper that had been typed out and prepared. And it kind of said, here's what's included if you decide to go with us. Um, all the different services, not just, you know, the, the actual placing of the braces, but any repairs that might happen or... Um, you know, as long as it takes till it gets done, like this is what it's going to cost. And there were two pricing options, which I thought was interesting. There was the full price if you want to pay in full, or there was the pay monthly option. And that one was obviously a little more expensive. So they're trying to make it palatable, right? And they're trying to make it accessible for more people that way. Now, in this document, it said this price expires, so this offer expires on XYZ, and there was a date there. So it was probably two months from the time that I was, you know, actually there. I can't remember exactly. But I did notice that. I was looking for that since I was kind of auditing this whole process. Um, that's kind of designed to do a little bit of, uh, um, yeah, like give you a deadline because it's forcing me my back against the wall. I can't just sit on this decision forever. I have to actually make a decision. Now, then the doctor came in and he said hello to Jed, took a look at his mouth. He spoke very fast. And I remember his lingo was like, I didn't even understand what he was saying. He was speaking a totally different language. He was talking to his assistant. She was typing out all the notes um, of what would have to be done to his mouth. And then he looked at me and he kind of gave his prescription of like, this is what we're going to have to do to him. And he spoke in the, in the present and future tense as if we were already his uh, his clients. It was not a conditional statement. It wasn't like, well, if you decide to work with us, this is what we would do. There were no woods, okay? It was, we are going to blah, blah, blah. And that, again, is a very intentional tactic on their part. Like, they're already imagining that I'm their customer. They want me to imagine that as well. So he left, and I'm back to the salesperson. 
And this is where it got super cool. So she sits down, pulls out this folder again, and there is an agreement page inside of that folder. Now, remember, at this point, <clears throat> we haven't actually decided that we're going to go with them yet. And so she was just pointing out, like, I need you when you decide whether you want to work with us or not, I need you to actually sign this document. And this is sort of when we pledge to one another that we're going to work together. Now, this is how she worded it to me, though. She said, why don't you just go ahead and sign this? If you decide to change your mind, it's not a big deal. But then we at least have this piece of the paperwork done. This is the very first step that has to happen before we can take action on anything else. So why don't you just get it signed? And that way, if you decide you don't want to do it, you can just cancel. And I was like, OK, well, let me just read it. So I read it and I signed it and I made sure that I could back out if I changed my mind. Then she says this. She says, well, the next step would be for him to come back and us to take pictures of his teeth. We have to do a panelips. We have to do all these x-rays. Um, she said, that might be like two or three weeks from now before we can squeeze him in. Do you want me to go and see if Kendra can come in right now and real quick squeeze him in and just take his picture? Then we can get that out of the way and we can get started a whole lot faster. And if you decide not to work with us, then this will just be on us. No big deal. Did you catch that? So here she is asking me to take the next step as a customer, even though I haven't officially said yes, and they're wording it in such a way that, hey, it's on us. This is a, you know, a favor we're doing for you. If you decide you don't want to do it, no big deal. So what this is in the sales world is something called micro conversions. So a conversion is when you make a step, uh, a step that says, yes, I want to buy. Sometimes the way to get someone to say yes to a big investment is to get them to say a bunch of little yeses to smaller decisions that aren't as scary. So I said, sure, let's go ahead and get that taken care of. And so they came in, took pictures of his mouth. It was like a five minute process, really fast. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh, this is so smart because this is a 40 minute drive from my house and I'm saving myself time if we decide to come here. And then she closes with this line. She says, well, why don't we go ahead and schedule your next visit for when we actually put the braces, um, the expander on? And if you decide that you don't want to end up working with us, we'll just cancel it. But that way we at least have you in our schedule because we kind of book out way in advance. And so I said, sure, let's do it. And it was like three weeks from that day. And we took care of that. And then I went home. So... Oh, there's so much good stuff here. That was another example of a micro conversion. So here's what I want you to think about. At some point, you have to actually pitch your offer. And this is hard, I think, for us, especially in the CSA space or if you have a high ticket pro product. Sometimes we're kind of jumping around and we don't want to just finally come out and say, yeah, man, this is 485 bucks. Like we dance around it almost like we feel bad that we're asking people to invest that much in us. But at some point, you do actually just have to put the offer out there. And for the right customer, they're not going to flinch. All right. So we need to be confident in our offer and we need to say it at the right time and just say it with confidence. So what is your offer? What is your welcome offer? And is it clear. It was very clear when I sat down in that office. The orthodontist um, assistant showed it to me. It was on paper. This is what comes with it. Bullet points. And here's the end result. We're trying to get an amazing smile, right? This is how we know you're done when your teeth look like this and your son is smiling again, okay? So there was a very clear, simple plan. Step one, step two, step three. Step one, take pictures of your mouth. Step two, we're gonna put the expander in your mouth. And step three, we're gonna put the braces on in brackets and he just comes and manages that for like a year and a half and then we're done, okay? And I had a clear sense of this is when we're finished. We'll be done in 18 months, maybe even earlier. So what does that process look, for, look like for you and your business? In your sales funnel, you need to have a clear welcome offer. At some point, you need to pitch the first sale. What is it that you're leading with? And is it clear or is it confusing? Because no one's going to step into a confusing space. They're, they're going to go somewhere else. 
So I always like to encourage farmers, like on your sales page, if you if you have a high ticket price item, on your sales page of your website, you should um, have have it all broken down into a simple step one, step two, step three kind of a system. Show them what the step one should be the very first thing they do. Like in this case, it was we're going to take X-rays of your mouth, and um, or maybe for, in their case, it would be we're going to give you an assessment and let you know. Um, this is kind of the prescription we have for your son. Step two for them would be like, we're actually going to give you the treatment. And step three would be, you're going to have an amazing smile. So step three is always the end result. What is, what is the transformation look like? You want to help your customers see the journey from a bird's eye view. Okay. So get clear on what your offer is. And then second of all, make sure that you build in some little micro conversions. What could that look like for you? Do you have small little yeses that are not so intimidating, that are less risky, that help a person inch closer? So, you know, these lead magnets that I talk about, those are in a a small way, they're micro conversions. No, you're not ready to buy a CSA yet, but are you ready to at least download this document that's gonna show you what's gonna be in the box? Oh yeah, well that's free, I can do that. That's a micro conversion. I've just gotten them to say yes to something that doesn't take a lot of risk. And now they're a little bit more comfortable saying yes to the next thing because they feel like I'm holding their hand and I'm guiding them and they're beginning to trust that I know the way. Okay, let's move on to the next step. This was step six. I call this the consideration phase um, or the follow-up phase. So after we had been there, I think it was maybe a week later, five days later, we got a postcard in the mail. It was handwritten by uh, the woman that had been our salesperson and um, she actually wrote something on there to Jed by name. And I thought, well, that's a really nice touch. We also reviewed the folder and prospectus and the contract together, me and my husband. And I was just impressed with the quality of that marketing. The other um, orthodontist didn't have a big fancy folder like that. I know that sounds so dumb that I'm pointing that out, you know, is it is it because they had a fancy folder that I decided to go with them? No, but you know, it helped. It helped. So how much did it cost for them to make that fancy folder? That might have been a couple of dollars, but man, it made an impression. They were a professional place, right? Um, and I, I got a phone call from them as well. Like, hey, are you still thinking that you want to do this with us? Okay, so there was a follow-up process on the part of the orthodontist team. So I I guess what I want to ask you here is that sometimes in the sales process, in the sales funnel, there there should be a follow-up process, especially if it's a high ticket type thing. And there are many ways that you can build this. You can do it personally. You can reach out by phone or a personal email, but you can also set up automations um, that follow up with someone once they've raised their hand and perhaps given you their email address, then you know they're interested in this type of product. You can start sending them emails that slowly sell them the product or remind them of the offer and tell them, hey, there's a deadline. Do you want to get started? Um, but just be thinking about what could your follow up sequence look like? Maybe it's a weekly email, you know, just letting them, reminding them that you're in their ecosystem and that this is the kind of stuff you do and how you add value. The point is that your customer is is going to have to consider. They're going to go through this consideration phase where they, especially if it's a high ticket thing, like, is this something I want to do? And sometimes this is a long process. Sometimes it's pretty fast. Sometimes you can coach it along if you have this follow-up process in place. Another thing to think about here is who has the buying power in that customer family and that customer unit. Um, in my case, it was me. It was the mother who was in charge of the purse strings, who was in charge of this decision. I think it's interesting that we ended up going with the doctor that I actually had met. And I think that I would have um, not felt comfortable saying yes to the other person if I hadn't actually met them because I'm the one who's who's writing the check and and making the, the financial decisions in our family. So that's just something to kind of think about too. Who is who is the person that actually makes those decisions in your customer's family? Now, I was weighing the pros and cons of the decision. I was looking at things like price, the speed of execution, like one doctor was promising a faster result than the other one, Um, the referrals, so the power of the referrals. I was thinking about customer service, so I really liked the waiting room. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I could imagine myself having to sit in there for a while for the next, you know, 18 months. So I was looking at how comfortable is the waiting room, how kind it was the team, and I felt really well taken care of. I was impressed by that. And just the location and the proximity to my son's new school. We're, we're taking him to an aviation school next year. And so I thought about that. I'm like, do I really want to be driving all the way back to Fremont um, and then take him all the way back to school on those days that he has to kind of go in in the middle of school? That was also a consideration as well. So your customer is going to have different things that they're thinking about, what's valuable to them as they're making this decision. You've got to know what those key things are. And that's the stuff that you then spend a lot more energy on when you're creating your marketing assets. Okay, we're almost done. So I made a decision. This is the the moment in the sales funnel where the conversion happens, okay? I signed the contract. I really signed the contract and I called them and I said, hey, I've decided that I'm, that I'm definitely going to go with you guys. And I wanted to get the payoff amount and confirm that I could mail them the check. Like I wanted to say, hey, make sure this is for real. I'm for real. I want to send you the check right now. Do I have to mail it to you? Do I, can I just bring it in on the first day? Because we paid in full. So that was a pretty quick part of the process, actually, but it is an important step. And it's probably the one where, you know, the doctors are all celebrating. That's what we all work so hard for is that moment. Um, oftentimes it happens really fast when it actually, when it finally does happen, but let's not discount it. So um, just make sure that there is obviously a moment where conversion can happen, that pushing the buy now button is not hard. They don't have to hunt around for it. Okay. It should be easy to start doing business with you. All right. And then the final step was what I call product fulfillment. So we've paid for this service. My, my son's been going now for about three months. And this is an important part of the step. And we often don't think about this as part of the sales funnel, but it is a part of the sales funnel. We don't stop. Uh, we don't just like celebrate once we've taken the person's money. We have to actually deliver the product and service and we need to do it well. Um, why is that so important? Well, because your business all starts with a great product. No marketing funnel can rescue a bad product. I'm really sorry. So if you don't, if you don't actually get results for people, if you're not quality, um, you're going to have a hard time staying in business. Um, so I'm expecting this dentist to deliver results. And the sooner, the better. And the jury is still out. So far, so good. I've noticed that um, Jed's whole face has changed just because we had to expand his palate. So I've noticed his jaws kind of looks different now and his teeth at first they were separated even further apart, but now they've come back together. It's like happening really fast. And before you know it, we're going to be putting the bottom braces on. Like I'm seeing results and I'm pretty excited. And my friend Kimberly, who's the dental hygienist says that in most cases he gets his patients um, out like three months earlier than he even says. So I'm super excited about that. Now, if he does his job well, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to refer him to my friends, right? I might even go and leave a Google review uh, for him if I really like him. Or I might send my second son, Josiah, there when it's time, right? So he, he can make additional money off of my family if he does well with the first sibling. Not only is he hoping that I'm going to refer to friends, but he's hoping I'm going to send more family members there. So product fulfillment is a huge part. And there was even kind of like a little bit of an excite phase moment. This is part of the customer value journey that I teach. The moment after somebody buys, um, you want to try and create this moment of excitement where <clears throat> you either give them a quick win or you give them a gift or you just do something unexpected, a surprise and delight moment. The very first visit when we showed up there to get the expander put in to his palate, um, they gave him a little backpack and they gave him an electric toothbrush. Okay, I've never had an electric toothbrush in my life. I'm, I'm kind of like cheap when we do the manual toothbrushes, so I've never invested in that. Well, you know, the fact that he bought an electric toothbrush, like I was like, that's cool. Wow, you didn't just give him a toothbrush like everyone else does at the dentist office. You're giving him a fancy pants toothbrush that costs some extra money. And I just noticed that. And that was a little bit of a, you know, bonus points, brownie points for him. So all part of product fulfillment, excite phase, and making sure that you deliver 
on what you promise, okay? So knowing the result, here's the application for you. What is the result that your customer is actually looking for? You need to be super clear on that. What is the transformation that they're actually seeking? Because it's not just, I want you to put braces on my son's teeth, right? Like technically that's what I'm paying for, straight teeth and the braces of themselves and the time that he goes there and the service that the orthodontist does to make the teeth move, like that's what I'm technically paying for. But what I really want is self-confidence for my son. I want my son to smile more. I want him to talk more because he, I know he's worried about showing his teeth and that's why he doesn't talk a lot. I'm thinking about like dating girls and like feeling handsome and confident. I'm thinking about job opportunities and like, you know, how you look matters, uh, status, handsome children. Did I just say that out loud? I did, but you guys, that's in my head. Like those are all some of the dreams that I have for my son. And I see this as a way to get there. So what result is your customer actually looking for? They don't just want to buy produce. They want something else. They want um, a deeper sense of an identity as a foodie, right? They want to live out their identity or they want to feel a sense of community or they want to feel like they're doing something to help the environment. And so you're scratching that itch for them or they love to cook and you are giving them the paint for their canvas, okay? Like what is the thing that you're doing for them? You've got to know what that is and you've got to deliver it. You've got to deliver it or they will stop coming to you. That is so important. So don't forget to fulfill on the product. That is super, super important. Okay, so let's wrap this up. I wanna just review what were the elements of this funnel. Well, first of all, they had a very clear problem that they solved for people. Their product exists, their service exists to solve a clear problem. They had a great attraction strategy, so word of mouth, SEO, a strong Google business profile, the use of Google reviews. They had a lead generation strategy. So once a person becomes aware that they exist, there was a way for them to reach out and actually make contact with the business. So they primarily relied on people to make phone calls, um, but word of mouth was their big one. They give referral points, referral rewards to their customers, and that's how they get most of their new leads. They also had um, a process for honoring the objections that I was having. They had um, all kinds of information in a brochure. They had information on their website so that I would be able to research the questions that I had so I would know whether or not I wanted to move forward and work with them. There was a moment of conversion. There was an offer presented to me on a piece of paper where everything was spelled out and it was clear. The price was clear. The pricing options were clear. And there were mi micro conversions that were offered to me to make it a little bit easier to say yes to the big decision. Then there was a welcome period when I showed up um, with that sign. There were gifts given to us so that we really felt like we were a part of the community and they were glad we were there, all of that customer service. And then they had a testimonial process that they hugely rely on. Their business is probably built on word of mouth, on testimonials, on reviews. And so they have a strong process and system in place to make sure that they mine those from their future customer. All in all, a streamlined system. And I hope this has helped you see um, what the marketing framework can look like in this kind of an industry, in, in the orthodontics industry. But it also works on your industry, on a farm business. And so that's my challenge to you is I want you to do an audit of your own sales funnel. Um, what is your attraction strategy? How are you making people aware that you even exist? What are you doing to start engaging with them, right? What are you doing to get them on your email list? What are you doing to overcome their objections? Do you know their objections? Do you have information anywhere on the website, in social media, in emails that, that answers those questions so that they want to keep moving forward? Do you have an actual welcome offer? Do you actually ask them to take the step with you? Or are you hemming and hawing about it? Do you make it easy to find the buy now button? Or is your online store a hot mess and you can't figure out what to buy first? Do you have those excite moments where once they buy, you give them a little something as a bonus or you just make them feel really welcome so they feel like this was a great decision? Do you have additional products that you can sell to them? Do you have a testimonial um, uh, acquisition process, right? Like all of these questions, I want you to mull over and maybe you can add 
you can find a hole in your in your sales funnel. Maybe there's one spot where you're like, whoa, like I don't have a system there. I don't have that part of the funnel. My friends, maybe one of the reasons that you're not selling as much as you would like is because your funnel is broken. Maybe your pipeline is missing a pipe, right? So that's what happened to me in my early years. I realized I did not have a lead generation strategy. I did not have a way to get people's email address. And once I created a system for that, the floodgates opened. So you may have many of these things in your funnel. There might just be one thing that's blocked. And once you fix that, everything starts working. Well, that is my podcast for today. I hope that was helpful for you. And I want to encourage you to go back and listen to episode 133, where I do a very similar thing with my uh, Hocking Hills Canopy Tour sales funnel. That one is also really well done. It'll give you another example. So I, I encourage you to go listen to that. Today's show notes can be found at mydigitalfarmer.com forward slash 173. And if you like today's episode, or if you just had your, your, your world rocked um, from something that was said today, would you please go and leave me a, you know what? No, don't leave me a rating or a review on the podcast. That would be nice too. But go tell someone in one of the Facebook groups that you're in for farmers, would you go tell someone that my podcast exists? That would be so awesome because I just really want as many farmers as possible to know that I'm around. And I don't think everybody knows that I, that I'm here. And so that would be a huge gift for me. Just go post about it or mention it in passing in a comment. Um, I would absolutely love that. All right. Don't forget, I'm now on Instagram at My Digital Farmer. I would love to uh, catch up with you there in my Instagram stories. Thanks for joining me today. Have a wonderful week, everyone. And I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.